Captain Featherstone adjusted to a more comfortable position within his padded command chair. He was strapped into the cockpit of his Warhammer battle mech, a 70-ton humanoid-shaped war machine bristling with advanced weapons and protected by layers of defensive armor. Its impressive bulk was suspended from a launch scaffold built into the cavernous storage bay of the Instigator, a wedge-shaped Leopard-class dropship currently in low orbit over Footfall 3. He was not alone on this mission. Three other powerful battle mechs completed his lance a lance that he was commanding for the first time in battle. Who the hell are these guys? Captain Featherstone said under his breath as he reviewed the intel displayed on his dashboard holo projector. Featherstone swiped through the images of the enemy mechs taken by a warrior VTOL before it was swatted out of the sky by high-velocity autocannon fire. It was a standard four-mech lance in a diamond formation, a 75-ton Black Knight, flanked by two 55-ton mechs, a Shadowhawk and a Dervish, with a 70-ton archer taking up the rear. The Dervish pilot's aggressive position was confusing to the captain. The 55-ton DV-1S was a long-range missile fire support carrier similar to the much larger 70-ton archer, and yet this one was up front and in harm's way. This lance should be in a square formation, with the long-range support mechs in the back. It reeked of incompetence. The dervish pilot was reckless, and the lance commander was too green to reel his lance mate in, or just didn't understand the danger the diamond formation posed to his lance. The enemy's behavior really wasn't much of a surprise. It lined up nicely with the information supplied by the Mercenary Review Board. Skull Squadron was formed very recently, and little was known about them. They had taken a dozen short-term missions, mostly for the Federated Commonwealth, and now they were in Capellan Confederation space attacking fuel facilities on Footfall 3. The Black Inferno Merc Company owned those facilities, and as a member of Black Inferno, Featherstone was sworn to protect them. Black Inferno had enemies, and this strike would certainly disrupt operations in this sector. But rival mercenary companies almost never made war without the endorsement of a patron, such as a great house or periphery state, as it would risk them being labeled as pirates. He shook the thought from his mind. All of this is irrelevant. We are here to defend the last fuel facility on this planet and destroy or drive the mercenaries away and that's it. The invading mercs looked like rookies, but they managed to fight their way through the Black Inferno Rapid Deployment Forces, made up of light mechs and armored vehicles resulting in the destruction of two of the three fuel facilities located on this planet. However, the enemy mechs bore scars from those fights, especially the dervish, whose myomers, or artificial leg muscles, could be seen through holes in its ravaged armor. The left arm, including the close-range weapons mounted there, was heavily damaged and looked disabled. We should be more than a match for them, Featherstone thought to himself momentarily allowing himself the pleasure of imagining the kills he was going to make today. A deep rumbling vibration shook him. The result of the leopard's armored shell slicing through Footfall 3's upper atmosphere as it traveled at high speed from low orbit towards the drop zone. The lights in the hangar switched over to dark red, bathing his lance and surrounding equipment with a crimson glow. The familiar voice of pilot Lieutenant Sharpova crackled to life over the ship-wide announcement system. Drop warning, 10 minutes. All technical personnel clear the hangar. Her voice was a bit higher pitched than usual, betraying her high level of anxiety. The technician on the scaffold surrounding Featherstone's cockpit made a final adjustment to the armored radio set housed on his mech's right shoulder, then turned towards him and gave him two thumbs up before exiting to a personnel compartment at the rear of the mech bay. The Lance was now alone in the cave-like dropship interior. Breaker Lance, start warm-up sequence, Featherstone commanded over his intercom system. He rapidly flicked switches on his control panels both in front of him and over his head. Lights blinked to life and he felt the initial jerk of myomers activating in the limbs of his warhammer. The computer calmly confirmed systems readiness in its artificial female voice through the cockpit loudspeakers. Reactor, online. Sensors, online. Weapons, online. All systems, nominal. 
The remainder of Breaker Lands checked in one by one over their radio link and confirmed that their mechs were ready for combat. Breaker Lance was named after the reason it existed, to break the pilots of their bad habits. These mech warriors were all busted from lieutenants down to cadets and sent to Featherstone for retraining after coming up short on past missions. Featherstone himself was taken off active duty and sent to Footfall 3 as punishment for his arrogance, lack of tactical awareness, refusal to follow the mission plan, and refusal to follow orders during combat. Featherstone conducted a visual check of the mechs and their support scaffolding and felt a sense of pride well up inside him. In his opinion, the men who sent these mech warriors for corrective training were foolish, small-minded, and incapable of accurately judging the capabilities of their mech warriors. They failed to correctly identify Featherstone's tactical genius, and they failed to understand the mech warriors in Breakerlands. Only Featherstone had the clear vision required to fully understand the capabilities of these warriors. Across from Featherstone's Warhammer was an 11 meter tall PHX-1 Phoenix Hawk, weighing in at 45 tons. It was piloted by Cadet Aboye, who was sent to Featherstone to correct his inability to make the mission his priority, rather than his obsessive bloodlust. What his previous commanders didn't realize is that Aboye was a wolf, a lone hunter, and an assassin who didn't need orders to be effective on the battlefield. He just needed to be unleashed at the right time. His mech was perfectly suited to him. Fast and agile, hard-hitting and flexible, it was a terror-inducing opponent for lighter mechs and a dangerous threat for damaged heavier mechs. A boye would do well today. Two more battle mechs were slung in their cradles in the rear bays. A 35-ton PNT-8Z Panther and a 40-ton ASN-21 Assassin. The Panther was an unusual design. At 35 tons, it was technically classified as a light mech, but it traded its speed for armor and the impressive power provided by an arm-mounted Defiance Industries heavy laser. Aside from the head and the cockpit, which was fashioned like a hunting cat complete with eyes and fangs, the mech lacked embellishment favoring practical angled armor plating on its chest and limbs. The Panther was slow and not suitable for scouting, but jump jets mounted in its legs made it maneuverable enough to guard a heavier mech or provide fire support for light lances. Its pilot was an ex-Kurata infantry soldier named Cadet Ishikawa, who never talked about how she came by the mech or how she learned to be a mech jock. She was sent to Featherstone due to her lack of flexibility and inability to take initiative. Featherstone saw something different. He saw a reliable and dependable mech warrior who followed orders to the letter, one that would ignore distractions in order to complete the mission priorities set. He couldn't imagine having a better warrior to guard his back in the thick of battle. Hanging in the last bay was an assassin, an ungainly looking medium weight mech that looked top heavy with a large bubble canopy sitting on top of its bulbous torso. The machine was lightly armed and armored in order to make space for a heavy Vox 280 fusion engine normally used in mechs almost twice the assassin's weight. The result was a machine that could sprint up to 118 kilometers an hour on level ground, but was very lightly armored. Indeed, speed was its primary defense, and it required an aggressive pilot to be combat effective. The pilot of the assassin was Cadet Bjerke, who was as aggressive as they come. Stylizing himself after an ancient Viking warrior, Birke was hot-headed and prone to violence at even the smallest insult. His former commander banished him to Breakerlands to get his rage issues under control. The assassin bore plenty of scars due to his inability to control himself. The mech was a Frankenstein's monster of half a dozen or more assassins that had been shot out from under the reckless pilot. However, Birke was the most fearless pilot Featherstone had ever known. He was relentless and was excellent at putting pressure on long-range support mechs or vulnerable damage mechs trying to leave the battlefield. Featherstone called out to his lance through a dedicated communications line using his best no-nonsense command voice. Breaker Lance, listen up! Today we face a rookie mercenary company that's in over their head. Their primary targets are the fuel refineries and storage facilities we've built here. They've managed to destroy two but have paid a price to achieve that. 
They're bloodied and should be easy targets for a fresh lance such as ours. Our objective is to destroy or drive away the enemy, and I've developed a plan to do just that. Featherstone touched a transmit button on his command console and sent a three-dimensional model of the battlefield and surrounding terrain to each of his mech warriors. The holographic projectors within their cockpits lit up and displayed the interactive model alongside data packets detailing the info he had on the enemy lance. He continued, Lieutenant Sharpova will bring us in low behind a mountain ridge east of the main valley, then pop over at the last second and deploy us at the northern pinch point before the valley opens up into an open plain where the last remaining refinery is. It's an aggressive drop, but it's been plotted to give our dropship the best possible protection and to give the enemy as little warning as possible. The refit for this dropship has not been completed and the instigator has no functional weapons, so it's strictly up to us to finish the job our brothers and sisters started. We don't know who hired these goons, but we know why they're here. Sea bills. If we make this mission too expensive for them, they will turn tail and run, so that's what we will do. Our primary target is the 75-ton Black Knight. We will isolate and destroy it. The secondary target is the 55-ton Dervish, which is already weakened and should fall easily. Once their lance leader is down and the wingmate destroyed, the lance will turn tail and run. We will then pursue and destroy the remainder at our leisure. Featherstone paused for dramatic effect, then continued, putting a steel edge in his voice. This is our home. These pricks have come into our house, broken our stuff, and killed our people. So what are we going to do about it? The communications line filled with the emphatic vows of revenge, carnage, and blood from the remainder of the lance. Cadet Bjerke let out a string of expletives that bordered on a mad ramblings. Featherstone was satisfied with the response and continued. Very good. Today we change the reason why we are called Breaker Lance. From here on in, we'll be known as the lance that breaks the enemy, one that crushes our foes beneath our armored feet. Featherstone's lance mates let out a cheer after his rousing speech, and he continued with his instructions. Now, I want a clean drop by the numbers. Once we hit the ground, we will form up behind cover and prepare for battle. Understood? Hooah! yelled the mech warriors under Featherstone's command. Breaker Lance was ready. Just in time, too. Featherstone felt a 2G press on his body as the dropship aggressively slowed, its sleek outline barely visible above the intervening rocky ridge that separated it from the long valley where the enemy mechs were steadily marching towards their target. Lieutenant Sharpova's voice came through the speakers mounted within the mech warrior's neuro helmet. Prepare for combat maneuvers, she cried out. Featherstone grabbed the overhead handles inside his cockpit, sunk himself into his command chair, and let his automatic restraining straps tighten around his hips and torso in preparation for the rough ride he was about to be exposed to. Within seconds, the instigator climbed 200 meters, banked hard to port to clear the ridgeline, then dived for the drop zone strategically chosen for its cover behind several large storage towers. Featherstone grunted through breathing techniques to combat the 3G turns and dives, but was surprised by a hard 6G deceleration that threatened to knock him out cold. That was way too much, he grunted to himself as the edges of his vision darkened, and he started to see stars. The circular drop portals in the dropship's floor snapped open under the force of high-powered pneumatics, as expected. But instead of a rush of air... His mech was subject to a flurry of what looked like building debris accompanied by an immense cacophony of armor plating scraping concrete and steel at high speed. The instigator shuddered alarmingly, then lurched to a stop. The lights in the bay switched to green, signaling it was safe to drop. Lieutenant Sharpova yelled over the intercom, Dismount! 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 dismount. dismount. Featherstone pushed his control sticks forwards. The immense barrels of his arm-mounted particle projection cannons, or PPCs for short, tilted towards the ground in order to avoid following his drop. With a smooth movement born of repetition, he reached up and pulled the black and yellow handle above his head to actuate the release mechanisms holding his warhammer in its cradle. With a loud crack, 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 the heavy-duty clamps released and his mech started to drop. 
Due to inertia, the descent started slowly, but then accelerated quickly, reaching 70 kilometers an hour before the Warhammer's two-toed feet slammed into the ground, its knee actuators flexing into a low squat to absorb the impact. Featherstone pushed down on his pedal controls lightly to stand the powerful war machine up to its full height of 14 meters. Something has gone horribly wrong, Featherstone thought to himself as he turned his warhammer around to observe the condition of his lance and the dropship. He immediately saw what the problem was. Lieutenant Sharpova had misjudged the drop zone and brought the instigator down hard on a tall concrete and steel industrial building and then plowed through a set of high-tension power lines. Broken concrete columns and beams, rebar, structural steel, and other debris littered the drop zone. The dropship station-keeping thrusters threw concrete dust everywhere, making visual confirmation difficult, but he could roughly see the outline of Cadet Aboye's Phoenix Hawk standing where it should be, but Cadet Ishikawa's Panther was resting on its rear end and was partially buried in rubble. Cadet Bjerke had it the worst. His assassin dangled partially out of his drop portal, but the upper portion of his mech remained in the instigator's mech bay. Cadet Bjerke screamed over the intercom, Fuck! 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 Cut me loose, goddammit! Cut. Me. Loose! A bright blue surge of power arced between the high-tension lines that had twisted around the port side stabilizer and engine nacelle and grounded through the hull of the instigator into the building below it. If the instigator tried to leave, those power lines would be just as effective as high-energy particles from a PPC, ripping the stabilizer from the dropship's armored hull and cutting through the engine compartment. A wound like that could prove fatal to the warship, and cause a catastrophic power failure, or worse, an explosion powerful enough to destroy the ship. Featherstone hit his comms override, cancelling out all other communications, and called out, Instigator, do not exfil. Maintain your current altitude. You are tangled in high tensile power lines. I say again, do not exfil. Confirm. Over. Lieutenant Sharpova called back in a shaky voice. Uh, understood, sir. Instigator will hold position. The, 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 the techs are working on Cadet Birke's drop clamps. They may have been damaged in our high G deceleration. High G is right, Lieutenant, Featherstone growled. That was one major fuck up, but we can still save the day. I don't care if you have to cut the clamps off with laser torches. Get that mech dropped immediately. While you are working on that, we will cut these lines and get you free. Featherstone did a quick calculation in his head. The enemy lance was at least 1500 meters away, so there would still be time to set up in a favorable position before they arrived, but they could use a little time in case the enemy moved faster than anticipated. There was no way the instigator went unnoticed, and he was sure the enemy was moving quickly to close with Breaker Lance. Luckily, the dropship and breaker lance were screened by large buildings. The enemy wouldn't be able to target them until they were at extremely close range. He decided to unleash Cadet Aboye. Cadet Aboye, go greet our guests and buy us some time, will you? And if you get the chance, take down that dervish. Permanently. Roger that, sir, Aboye replied. His phoenix hawk turned and disappeared into the dust cloud generated by the instigator. Featherstone did not expect to hear from him until he made a kill. Cadet Ishikawa, you're with me. We are going to cut these lines so the instigator can leave once Cadet Bjerke has been freed. Normally the Warhammer's PPCs would make short work of the power lines, but high energy particles had a habit of doing strange things when mixed with high voltage electricity. He was up to the medium and light laser batteries mounted in the Warhammer's torso and the heavy laser on the Panther's right arm to cut through the thickly armored, high tensile braided power cables. This would take some time. Cadet Eboye moved his Phoenix Hawk along the western wall of the valley at a steady walking pace and systematically scanned the pipes, tanks, conveyors, and concrete buildings littering the industrial landscape. It all looked the same after a while. Gray aluminum clad warehouses connected by silver pipes and conveyor scaffolding. He was fooled twice now by loading mechs standing upright in their maintenance gantries, waiting silently for the next working shift, but there was no sign of the enemy. His sensors were having a hard time penetrating all of the metal and concrete structures here. 
False heat signals from active equipment and pumps were constant. He couldn't trust anything but his eyes in the slowly fading light. At first he thought he was imagining things, but then there it was. A 55-ton dervish, standing uneasily next to a spider web of interconnecting pipes. Its red and black camouflage pattern doing a reasonable job breaking up its outline, even with the garish color scheme. This is it! The boy he thought excitedly. His eyes dilated to soak in every detail of the mech in front of him. He licked his lips eagerly once his eyes crossed over the heavily damaged leg armor plating and other damaged surfaces on the mech. This one won't last long against me, he whispered to himself, and then he switched off his radio set. Better to go dark than to let his position be triangulated accidentally by an errant radio transmission. Aboye slowed his mech down to a walk and dipped behind a four-story building. He would try to surprise his opponent and keep them off balance and terrified. The Phoenix Hawk stepped lightly within the building's shadow, stalking like a hunting cat, until he reached the corner. Then he sidestepped quickly and thumbed his heavy laser trigger stud, just as he cleared his cover. Azure light flared from the barrel of the heavy laser in his mech's right hand, held quick draw style like an ancient cowboy. It lashed out instantaneously, cutting through a low pipe connecting two buildings together before slashing upwards until it made contact with the dervish's left leg. Armor on the leg flared bright yellow, and silver liquid metal sprayed off to start small fires on adjacent buildings. The deep thrum of the laser stopped quickly as the condenser emptied of charge. A boy's heads-up display showed the weapon temporarily offline until the condenser reached enough power for another shot. The dervish flinched, probably the result of the pilot's reflexes more than anything else, and it turned away timidly to take cover from an adjacent building. Aboye noticed the left leg was a little lazy when it turned. It was likely that the armor had failed, and some of the laser energy burned through into the leg's myomers. The Phoenix Hawk pilot smiled to himself. The enemy mech was prey and Aboye was the hunter. Nothing would stop him from making the kill now that he smelled blood. Aboye pushed down hard on his foot pedals and brought the Phoenix Hawk to a full run. The 45-ton war machine slipped lithely around buildings and hopped over conveyors. It could run up to 90 kilometers an hour, and at that speed, it would easily catch up to the dervish. However, Aboye had something else in mind. He would get ahead of his opponent and ambush him just when he thought it was safe. He would stalk and chip away at the mech, creating maximum anxiety in his opponent, and when the mech was crippled, he would make the kill. Oboye would savor every moment, and maybe even take a souvenir from the pilot if he was able. An ear, perhaps? Maybe a tooth, if he could. The Phoenix Hawk pounded down the street, its feet smashing through pavement and leaving tread marks in the reinforced industrial roadway. Low building windows shattered from the shock of their impact. A short trill from his heads-up display confirmed his heavy laser was ready to fire again, but this time Aboye was going to get close. He wanted his opponent to know that he could be killed at any time, so he switched his active weapons over to the medium-weight lasers and machine guns mounted in his mech's forearm housings. He stopped 50 meters from an intersection and readied himself using a large building's visual shadow to hide in. The dervish staggered through the intersection at 60 kilometers an hour, the slight limp in his left leg slowing it down, straight into a boyer's targeting pip. The enemy mech was tall for a 55-ton medium machine, with a thin profile and domed head set low in the torso. All of these features made the target difficult to hit when moving at full throttle, but due to its damaged leg, speed was less of a factor. Aboye let loose with his medium lasers, their emerald green beams lashing out in front of the enemy mech, causing no damage. Aboye corrected his aim with his machine guns. High-velocity slugs and tracers fired at 1,200 rounds per minute, stitched their way up the dervish's right shoulder and across the crown of its head, rattling the pilot and blasting off some of its precious protection. The dervish didn't even try to return fire and quickly cleared the intersection. It proceeded up the street and turned eastward onto a smaller connector road. A boye started laughing. Low at first and then pitching up into a howl of glee. There would be blood to satiate his hunger. 
He was in a sporting mood and decided to pause to give the dervish a head start before racing after it at full speed into the smaller connector road. There were a number of structure fires here and the confined street was mostly obscured with smoke, but he could still make out the dervish as it raced at its best speed ahead of him towards what looked like an opening in the industrial landscape. A boyer opened up with his heavy laser and scored a good hit on the enemy mech's unspoiled rear torso armor. It didn't do much damage, but being shot in the thin back armor was unnerving even for the most seasoned mech warriors. It would amp the pilot's anxiety up to unbearable levels. The dervish turned south at the opening and broke from Aboye's field of view, but that would be remedied quickly at the speed Aboye was moving. The Phoenix Hawk slowed down a bit and leaned hard to maintain a high speed turn, but stumbled into something unexpected. The 75 ton Black Knight suddenly appeared in front of him, its legs bent into a crouch to hide its immense bulk behind the surrounding roof line. It stood up to its full 16 meter height at the appearance of the Phoenix Hawk and revealed its many potent weapons bristling from its arms and torso. Aboye's eyes widened in panic at the sight of the giant matte black form in front of him. Its angled armor plating was stylized to look like a metal clad warrior of old, but instead of a sword it wielded double particle projector cannons and half a dozen medium lasers. It was the kind of firepower that could obliterate a medium mech like the Phoenix Hawk in seconds. Aboye lifted his feet off the pedals and his Phoenix Hawk skidded to a halt only 30 meters in front of the Black Knight. In his peripheral vision, he caught a glimpse of a 55-ton Shadowhawk and beyond that, a 70-ton Archer. Were they here the whole time? A voice in his head screamed at him. He realized he was in a trance. He was so focused on making the kill that he blinded himself to other dangers and was led straight into a trap by the Dervish. Aboye was not the hunter, he was the hunted. All avenues were closed to him except the way that he came in. Maybe with his speed and agility he could survive, but as he turned, a familiar red and black camouflaged mech pushed its way through a building and blocked his escape route. The 55-ton dervish maneuvered much too quickly for a damaged mech. The limp must have been a show to entice the eager Phoenix Hawk pilot into a false confidence. The dervish opened its protective torso panels to reveal not long-ranged missiles, but two heavy short-ranged missile racks. Those two racks, combined with its arm-mounted rack, added up to 14 short-range missiles, packed with enough explosives to be a threat to even a heavy mech in close combat. All 14 missiles streaked out at the dervish in one massive barrage at torso level. Most of them impacted the Phoenix Hawk and completely obliterated its right arm, taking its heavy laser, a medium laser, and a machine gun with it. The remaining missiles struck the right leg and right torso, blasting away hundreds of pounds of armor in one salvo. The Phoenix Hawk skidded sideways five meters by the force of the blast alone, but it remained upright. A boy was frozen in his cockpit seat, making high-pitched unintelligible sounds in fear. He could not move but could only look in terror at the silent figure of the Black Knight standing in front of him. A warning klaxon sounded in his neural helmet speakers, warning him of incoming fire. Missiles were being launched from the heavy long-range racks mounted on the archer 300 meters away, but he couldn't move a muscle to avoid it. Forty missiles rained down on him, impacting all over his mech's upper torso and left arm, reducing his armor plating to scrap in an instant. The gyro in his mech couldn't compensate and he started to fall when a final blow from the nearby Shadow Hawk's chest mounted six tube short range missile pack struck the crippled Phoenix Hawk full force, caving in the machine's torso and knocking it on its back. The core of the fusion engine within the Phoenix Hawk's chest was fully exposed by the damage. No shielding remained to protect the mech and its pilot from the miniature sun burning within. Blue green light emanated from the mech's chest. The high heat devoured the mech's torso and burned into the cockpit. A boy screamed in horror as the deck plate below his feet liquefied and exposed him to intense, short-range gamma radiation. In less than a second, his entire body was incinerated into nothing more than carbon dust. Back at the drop zone, Cadet Ishikawa braced her mech and took aim at one of the heavy power transmission cables tangling the instigator within its web. 
The heavy laser in her panther's right arm thrummed, and cohesive light particles burst out from the weapon's muzzle, striking the cable, turning it into a bright orange glowing molten slag. From her perch in the cockpit, located in the panther's head, she could see the green and red flashes from Featherstone's torso-mounted laser batteries, cutting the last few cables, tethering the dropship. She and Featherstone had made good progress, untangling the hovering instigator, but now they had to prepare for battle. Birke had finally calmed down enough and stopped his incessant swearing over the intercom, which calmed her somewhat. But the fear that the enemy lance would come around the corner and start shooting was getting on her nerves. She couldn't wait to unleash her frustration on the enemy and rid the planet of their unwelcome presence. Captain Featherstone's voice burst out of her narrow helmet speakers. Cadet Ishikawa, we freed the instigator. Well done. Now it's time for us to prepare for combat. I will take the Warhammer to a position in front of the building screen, take the best cover available, and present a target for the enemy lance. I want you to stay on my left flank, hidden from view until I call for you, at which point you will rush out and focus your fire on the enemy Black Knight. It is imperative that we destroy that mech as soon as possible, then we can focus on the remainder. Cadet Eboye has not contacted us. I'm assuming he is still stalking the enemy and is preparing to strike. He knows what the plan is and will focus his fire on the Black Knight as well, once you join combat. Featherstone continued. Cadet Birke, once you are free from the instigator, you will attack the Black Knight if it is still standing. If the Black Knight is down, focus on the dervish. Once the enemy breaks, you will pursue and harass the enemy as they flee. I want you to keep them off balance as we hammer them into scrap with our heavy weapons. Everyone understand? Cadets Ishikawa and Bjorke returned their confirmation. Satisfied, Featherstone pressed hard on his foot pedals, and his Warhammer's two-toed feet clawed into the already smashed pavement, forcing the mech to sprint at its top speed of 64 kilometers per hour. He quickly cleared the buildings protecting the instigator and took up position behind a collapsed storehouse, giving him excellent cover without impeding his arsenal. He had a commanding view of the open square in front of him. Any mech stumbling into his battlefield was going to have a very bad day. The panther moved into position slowly, slinking completely hidden from view behind a tall pile of rubble. Ishikawa calmed her racing heart through breathing exercises and mental routines designed to let go of her physical body sensations and fully embrace the connection to her battle mech provided by her neural helmet. The neural helmet didn't just measure her inner ear to help the mech with balance. It also gave her the ability to partially embody the mech that she was piloting. It actually felt like the cockpit's armored glass was her face. The reinforced battle fists were her hands and the powerful lower actuators were her legs. It was thrilling, and a much preferable way to do battle than what regular infantry soldiers experience. Ishikawa kept her eyes on her sensor panel. Normally she would have poor reception in this position, but her electronics were enhanced by a link to Featherstone's sensor suite. He had a commanding view of the battlefield, and he would detect the heat signatures of the enemy as soon as they came into range. An audible high-pitched trill sounded over the headset, and a red triangle popped into existence on her heads-up display. The onboard computer analyzed the heat signature and labeled it BLKKNT, Black Knight. The enemy had arrived. Featherstone saw the red triangle on its heads-up display and did a quick calculation. By his estimation, the Black Knight was just behind a large storehouse on the edge of the large open square in front of him. If the Black Knight continued on its path, it would emerge from a street to the left of the building and come into full view. Featherstone rotated his torso slightly, laid his targeting pip over the street mouth, and waited. A high-pitched warning trill sounded again, and a second triangle popped up on his head's display much further to the left of the Black Knight. This was labeled by his targeting computer as a SDWHWK, Shadowhawk. The Shadowhawk was guarding the Black Knight's flank, and Featherstone assumed the archer was coming up from behind. This is good, Featherstone mused. Two on two, except I'm in cover, and my forces are fresh. What will you do, Commander? It's not polite to keep your hosts waiting. The Black Knight seemed to respond to Featherstone's question. It stopped moving forwards, and so did the Shadowhawk. Featherstone's brow furrowed in frustration 
It's likely the enemy commander was waiting for his archer to catch up before he burst out in unison with the Shadowhawk. The enemy lance was one mech short, and they needed to put as much firepower on Featherstone's Warhammer to neutralize it as fast as they could without suffering too much damage in the process. However, the enemy commander didn't know about Ishikawa's hidden panther or Oboye's lurking phoenix hawk. No, no, commander, Featherstone said out loud. This is my kill box, not yours. The enemy lance waited in cover for a full minute before the Black Knight and the Shadow Hawk dashed forwards into the 500 meter by 500 meter wide opening, hoping that speed would give them an advantage. But Featherstone was ready for them. His fingers flew over his control stick and armaments panel, activating weapons and firing them in quick succession. His PPCs roared to life, sending white-hot beams of ultra-high-speed energized particles towards the Black Knight, scoring a hit on its left leg the other sailing wide in front of the mech. A barrage of short-range missiles ripped out of the box-shaped launcher mounted on the Warhammer's shoulder, arcing towards the Shadowhawk at maximum range. Only a few struck home on the mech's torso, but it got the pilot's attention. The enemy lance returned fire, PPCs from the Black Knight, and shellfire coming from the Shadowhawk's shoulder-mounted autocannon. Most of the shots went wild or struck the rebel in front of the Warhammer. Both of the enemy mechs advanced at top speed, smashing through the low service buildings filling this portion of the industrial park. The Shadowhawk was faster and opened up a second volley from every weapon it had. Emerald laser beams, short-ranged missiles, and autocannon shells started striking the Warhammer all on its left side. This time the shots were accurate, mostly impacting the armored shell of the Warhammer's left arm and torso. The pilot had compensated for the cover disadvantage and showed expert marksmanship even while sprinting at top speed. Featherstone was shaken by the Shadowhawk's display of gunnery. The Warhammer was well armored, but even it couldn't withstand a persistent assault, and soon the Shadowhawk would be close enough to bring its two battle fists into play. The Black Knight let loose with two more PPC blasts, one of them sizzling a few meters over Featherstone in the Warhammer's head the other striking him in the right torso, sending magnetic interference through his sensor suite and blinding him for a moment. God damn it, that's it! Featherstone swore. He had to get his battle back moving. These mercs were excellent gunners, and the protection provided by the rubble pile wasn't sufficient. Speed would be his defense. These weren't the actions of rookie mech pilots, and doubt started to creep into his mind. Was he wrong about this group? Featherstone rotated his torso towards the Shadowhawk and let loose a blistering volley of secondary weapons fire from the Warhammer's laser batteries and machine guns. Red and green laser beams swept towards the Shadowhawk, followed by bursts of high-velocity slugs. The volley struck the Shadowhawk's right arm and leg, blasting off the remaining armor and exposed myomer bundles, weapon systems, and actuators. Blue arcs of power spilled out from its arm-mounted laser condenser and spilled to the ground, disabling the weapon for good. Featherstone smiled, and the doubt dissipated from his mind. He could still win this fight. Featherstone stomped on his foot pedals and turned the Warhammer away from the Shadowhawk, taking a parallel course to the Black Knight. He let loose a blast from a single PPC and launched his short-range missile pack, hoping to find an open spot in the enemy mech's armor. Alarms sounded in the Warhammer's cockpit, and the computer announced, Heat critical! The mech was seriously overheating. Battle mechs could dish out immense amounts of fire in a short space of time, but even the Warhammer's huge array of heat sinks couldn't dissipate the kind of heat generated by multiple weapons volleys. The risk paid off, however. Featherstone's PPC blast burned a hole in the Black Knight's right torso and exposed its inner workings to the one-two punch of high-explosive warheads. The concussion and shell fragments smashed through a heat sink array. Bright green coolant fluid spilled out of the radiator-like devices and splashed on the mech's legs, making the Black Knight look like a wounded alien predator, leaking green blood all over the ground. The damage wasn't fatal, but the Black Knight would have to reduce its firepower in order to prevent it from overheating and cooking its pilot or shutting down. Another alarm klaxon is sounded in the Warhammer's cockpit. This time it was a missile lock warning. The enemy archer had arrived at the battle by smashing its way through a building on the edge of the open square, clearing its firing arc for its lethal long-range missile batteries. 
The protective covers on the Archer's sloped torso-mounted LRM racks snapped open, and 40 missiles ripped out like a swarm of wasps towards the Warhammer. Many of the missiles impacted on the ground around the quickly moving Warhammer, ripping up service stations and storage yards. The others struck home pelting the Warhammer's upper torso, head, and arms with explosive shells. Armor blasted off the mech, and it staggered under the impact, but the mech's thick protective plates saved it once again. Cadet Ishikawa watched the battle unfold in her hiding spot, hands and feet hovering over the controls waiting in anticipation for the call to attack. All of the enemy mechs were committed and finally in view. They would witness the destruction of their lance leader in one quick concentration of firepower, breaking their resolve to fight. She heard her commander's voice calling over Breaker Lance's comms channel. Cadets Ishikawa and Boye, exit your hiding positions and destroy that Black Knight! Her left foot snapped over to the jump jet actuator toggle on the cockpit floorboard, but she hesitated momentarily. The tactical portion of her mind screamed a warning. If she jumped to a position close enough to threaten the Black Knight, she would place herself in a prime counterattack position from the Shadowhawk, or be caught out in the open and be vulnerable to the archer's LRM salvos. Would it not be better to strike the Shadowhawk and put it down immediately? Alternatively, she could use her jump jets to close the distance to the archer and get within its LRM system's safety range, forcing the enemy mech to stop using its most powerful weapon system in favor of its much less potent medium lasers. This would allow Featherstone to rally and focus his fire on the Black Knight and finish it off. No! Ishikawa firmly reprimanded herself inside her cockpit. I must follow my orders! She pushed her foot down on the floor toggle and switched over to jump jet mode before stomping with both feet on her pedals. The jump jets in her mech's legs roared to life and her 35-ton mech shot up into the air, arcing at a quick rate towards the Black Knight. At the apex of her jump, she lifted off the pedals, saving the remaining available charge in her jets to slow her descent before hitting the ground. That's when she started taking fire. A rapid succession of explosions rocked her panther mostly striking the machine on the left side torso, arm and leg, forcing the mech into a spin. The enemy archer pilot spotted her jump and blind fired its LRM racks without a targeting lock, using intuition alone to guide the double stream of missiles to their target. It was an impressive feat of marksmanship, one that Ishikawa would have marveled at if she was in a safe position, but right now she was fighting to keep her mech semi-upright as she fell towards the ground. The high-speed gyro in her mech's torso and neurohelmet connection to her inner ear could only do so much to keep the mech from tumbling out of control. She worked her pedals and adjusted her arms to act like counterweights, but she still hit the ground hard and at an awkward angle. Her left knee actuator exploded under the pressure, and the mech collapsed onto his left arm, falling face-first into an industrial food processing facility. Ishikawa was stunned by the impact. She saw stars and knew right away that she had suffered a concussion and probably broken ribs. With immense effort, she worked her controls, lifting the mech's left arm to prop the panther's torso off the ground and use its legs to get into a kneeling stance. From this stable position, she could easily target the ragged hole in the Black Knight's torso and threaten its engine or other critical systems. Her aiming reticle turned green and she lined up her shot, but before she could fire, the heavy impact of a well-placed kick rocked her mech, lifting it partially off the ground and turning it over to slam onto its back. Ishikawa grunted in agony as the impact of the assault aggravated her broken ribs. Through her armored glass screen, she saw the looming shape of the enemy Shadowhawk bending down towards her, its right battle fist cocked back and ready to rain a blow straight into her cockpit. She acted instinctively, bringing her panther's left arm up to protect its vulnerable face and mostly succeeded at deflecting the blow. The Shadowhawk's fist smashed into the left side of the panther's head, crushing the armor there and exposing Ishikawa's cockpit to the dust and debris from the surrounding carnage. Sparks showered from every panel inside the cockpit. The panther's head couldn't take another shot like that, and Ishikawa would have to do something fast if she wanted to live. The panther's right arm, housing its heavy laser, was clenched tightly by the Shadowhawk's left battle fist, but she still had the four-tube, short-ranged missile rack mounted in the chest. She turned the panther's head slightly in order to protect herself from a close-range explosion and activated the SRM firing stud on her control stick. Four short-range missiles launched from their tubes, 
one slamming into the Shadow Hawk's torso, blasting off some of the thin armor. But the other three impacted the chest plate obliquely and bounced off to strike the mech's right arm in a location already damaged by Featherstone earlier in the battle. The Shadow Hawk's arm lost power immediately and swung down limply from his shoulder, making it effectively useless. Ishikawa howled in glee at the lucky shot. The Shadow Hawk would have to stand up and let go of her mech if it wanted to use its left arm battle fist or remaining laser. The enemy machine had a chest mounted short range missile rack as well, but it was poorly positioned to attack in the same way her panther could at point blank range. Once freed, Ishikawa could use her arm mounted heavy laser and SRM rack to pound the already heavily damaged mech into scrap. She could even use her own battle fists if necessary. The panther was damaged, that was undeniable, but she still had the advantage if she could just stand up and fight. Ichikawa looked up into the cockpit of the enemy mech. Its pilot could clearly be seen through the smoke and dust blowing between them. To her surprise, the pilot took her right hand off her control stick and brought it up into a smart salute. It was a gesture of respect. Then she returned her hand to the control stick and started moving the Shadowhawk, but not in the way Ishikawa expected. The enemy pilot simply turned its torso slightly so that its shoulder-mounted autocannon could swivel to line up with the panther's cockpit. The Shadow Hawk had one final card to play, one that Ishikawa could not counter. When Ishikawa realized what was happening, she thrashed at her control stick and pedals, trying to reach the cannon with the panther's free hand or shake herself loose somehow. But the cannon barrel was out of reach, and the myomers of her lighter mech were no match for the strength of the heavier Shadowhawk. The enemy pilot was taking a risk firing her cannon like this at point-blank range, as it could damage her machine as well. But any shots fired would be absolutely lethal to the panther pilot. The first blast from the cannon destroyed the remains of the panther's armored glass screen, sending shrapnel deep into Ishikawa's chest and abdomen. Hot gas seared her lungs and the pressure wave of the exploding shell ruptured her eardrums. The wounds were mortal, and Ishikawa knew it. She started losing sensation in her arms and legs. The pain from her abdomen and ribs disappeared, and her breathing slowed into short gasping coughs. Her vision quickly darkened into shrinking tunnels, until finally she felt and saw nothing at all. The Shadowhawk pilot fired a second shell into the cockpit to ensure the battle was final. The 80 millimeter shell passed through Ishikawa's body and command chair with little resistance. The fuse didn't ignite until it impacted the rear bulkhead of the cockpit where it exploded, ejecting her bloody shredded remains onto the faceplate and torso of the Shadowhawk. Captain Featherstone grunted under the impact of a PPC blast and several medium laser strikes from the Black Knight. Forty more long-range missiles exploded all over his warhammer and surrounded buildings, quickly thinning out his armor reserves. He risked a glance at his tactical display and saw Ishikawa's marker icon blink out of existence. The icy sensation of dread filled his chest as panic started to set in. He let off a single PPC blast at the Black Knight, squarely nailing the machine in the left ankle, fusing the ankle joint. Yet he did not celebrate. His warhammer was overheating very seriously now. Most of the thick armor had been stripped from the mech's chassis by enemy PPC, laser, and missile fire, and now delicate systems were at risk of being destroyed. Ishikawa was down, and Aboye was missing from the fight entirely. Burke could drop at any second and join the battle, but Featherstone doubted his 40-ton assassin had the firepower to turn the tide. A cannon shell from the approaching Shadowhawk penetrated into the internal workings of his Warhammer's left arm, damaging the particle accelerator housed there and knocking out the PPC, leaving only one PPC symbol remaining on his HUD. Featherstone decided to cut his losses. This battle was over, but he had a plan to escape. He would retreat into the cover of the industrial zone, but first, he had to make sure the enemy lance didn't have enough speed to catch him. Featherstone started back paddling away from the Shadowhawk and used his machine guns and small rapid fire lasers to damage the exposed myomers and the Shadowhawk's legs. The Shadowhawk was the fastest of the enemy mechs, and he wanted to make sure it couldn't catch up to him. Instigator, this is Breaker 1. Prepare to evac, over. He announced over the radio set and waited for a reply but heard nothing but a hiss of static on his headset. Instigator, this is... He stopped talking when a flapping motion in his peripheral vision caught his attention. 
The armored cover protecting the radio set on his mech's right shoulder was open, and greasy brown smoke boiled out, contributing to the haze generated by the other fires burning all over his mech. It was clear that in his haste, the tech making final adjustment to Featherstone's radio set didn't close the cover correctly, and now it was knocked out of commission. Cadet Bjorke watched his tactical display inside the cockpit of his waylaid assassin and howled in rage. These damn techs were useless. They still weren't through the last clamp holding his mech in place, and his lance mates were fighting and dying without him. Anger override all of his remaining restraint, and he shouted over the intercom. Anyone near me that doesn't want to fucking die better get clear right now. He reached for his control sticks and started swinging with his battle mech's arms at the launch scaffold, hoping to shake the stuck mech free. Technicians screamed in horror as they were flung from the three-story tall structure surrounding the mech, or were smashed into a pulp by the thrashing arms. They pleaded to him to stop, telling him they were almost done, but Bjorke was beyond rational thought and negotiation. The scaffold groaned, gave way, and collapsed from the mech's exertions, but the stubborn clamp holding the mech into place held firm, and now the mech and scaffold were hopelessly jammed within the launch portal. Bjorke howled in rage and slammed his fists into the control panels, smashing the glass displays and bloodying his hands. He was going nowhere. Featherstone's warhammer was smoldering from the intense battering it had received. Deep rents scarred his mech's armor, and many of its protective plates were obliterated, exposing vulnerable systems. The war machine couldn't take much more damage before being crippled, but he had the advantage of speed and he fully intended to use it once he backed his way into a connector road exiting the plaza. Once he was there, he could rotate his mech and travel forwards at his full speed of 64 kilometers an hour away from the battleground and into the safety of the twisting industrial landscape. LRMs blasted the landscape around him, laser fire crisscrossed the little cover he had left, starting even more fires, and PPCs sizzled past blowing large holes through aluminum and concrete, but most of these shots went wild. The enemy mechs were seriously overheated, which affected both their targeting systems and their speed. Now was the perfect time to escape. Only 25 meters remained until he entered the road mouth. He let loose with light weapons and SRMs to slow down the approaching enemy mechs. The tactic was working. The enemy kept their mechs traveling perpendicular to Featherstone, hoping that their transverse movement would save them from taking critical damage but doing so meant they would be in a difficult position to pursue him once the Warhammer backed into the road mouth. Featherstone smiled in triumph. He would escape this battle, and once he refitted his mech, he would put together a task force to hunt these bastards down like the rats they were and obliterate them with prejudice. The Warhammer stepped back into the connector road, and the line of sight was broken to the enemy mechs. He started to turn his right foot in order to pivot the mech, when Firestone noticed a fourth red triangle pop up on his tactical screen. It warned him that an enemy mech was spotted by his sensor suite on the road right behind him, tagging it with the label DRVSH, Dervish. Featherstone's heart jumped in his chest. The wounded Dervish that he assumed was destroyed by a boye had moved undercover around the battlefield unnoticed, but it was far too close to be effective with its remaining close range weaponry. He doubted it would be enough to penetrate his back armor. Once he finished his maneuver, he would unleash his full arsenal and obliterate the mech, barely even pausing before continuing on to safety. Featherstone watched the dervish in his rear camera as he continued his maneuver and was slightly puzzled when the protective covers opened up on the mech's torso. Instead of the two 10-tube long-range missile racks that Featherstone expected to see, he could see that the dervish had been modified to house large bore short range missile tubes. Despite the grainy rear camera image, this modification was clearly visible. Bright yellow flashes exploded from the dervish's chest and black smoke boiled out of vents on the mech's back. Twelve heavy unguided warheads screamed out from their launch tubes and were joined by two more missiles from the dervish's right arm. All fourteen heavy missiles impacted the warhammer's rear torso armor plates. Their high-yield explosives detonated and created a high-pressure wave that smashed the thin rear torso armor into dozens of razor-sharp shards and pushed them inwards at high speed. 
The high-velocity shards spun like saws through the internal cavity of the Warhammer's chest, slicing through power cables, control systems, and the metal shielding protecting the mech's powerful gyro. All power from the fusion engine was permanently interrupted, making the Warhammer's limbs go limp like a marionette whose strings were cut. The mech continued to turn under its own momentum, and then started to collapse backwards towards the ground. Featherstone cried out in anguish when the lights in his cockpit blinked out and his heads-up display went dark. He tried to use his controls to adjust the mech's movement, but they were completely non-responsive. His warhammer was dead, and all he could do was hang on while it fell. The reptilian part of Featherstone's brain forced his arms and legs out wide, his hands grasping reflexively for a branch or some other solid object to stop his fall, but all he could find were the hard edges of his cockpit interior. The Warhammer slammed its back onto the pavement without any kind of cushioning whatsoever, throwing dust, pulverized armor remnants, and other debris into the sky. The immense thunderclap of the impact sent a shockwave through the air blasting wall panels inwards into office buildings. Featherstone's command chair came loose from its mounts and slid back into the cockpit a few inches, but the reinforced neural helmet support bracket didn't. The sudden misalignment took its toll on Featherstone's upper spine, causing several vertebrae to shift out of place and pinch his spinal cord, causing excruciating pain in his back and neck. Featherstone lost all sensation in his arms and legs, and he was having trouble breathing. His vision blurred, and all he could hear was a high ringing tone in both ears. He could see the red and black dervish through the cracked armored glass of his cockpit faceplate. It hesitated for a moment to survey the damage then turned and moved on towards its fellow lancemates in the open square. Every step of the massive 55-ton war machine sent waves of pain through Featherstone's back, but it could not compare to the pain of failure. Lieutenant Sharpova screamed into her intercom and demanded a report from the instigator's mech bay. The lead repair technician replied, but was panting heavily from exertion and was almost unintelligible. Bjerke's mech and scaffold was hopelessly stuck halfway through the launch portal, making a drop impossible. The techs would now need several hours to cut him free from the tangled mess. Lieutenant Sharpova looked at her status board. The station-keeping engines were getting warmer but weren't overheating, and she had plenty of fuel. Her ability to hover here was not an issue. Her ability to get out fast if needed was a worry, though. She couldn't engage the main engine and gain enough speed to achieve lift if there was a mech dangling from the instigator's belly. There was far too much risk of the mech breaking apart and causing damage to the instigator. No, she would have to use her vertical thrusters to gain altitude until the air thinned out enough to not cause resistance, and then engage her main engine to achieve low orbit. Besides, it might be easier to extract the mech at zero G. No one from Breakerlance had reported in for some time, and she was getting worried. She made a decision to prepare for ascent. The instigator was Breakerlance's battle taxi, but a lance of mechs was far less valuable than a dropship. She turned her head to her navigator and announced, We're getting out of here! Prepare for a power descent by vertical thruster to 20,000 meters. The air should be thin enough there to safely engage our main engine and achieve low orbit. The navigator nodded his head and started to check calculations and power curves to make the maneuver. Lieutenant Sharpova checked her flight controls one more time while making an announcement over the shipboard system, warning the crew that the instigator was leaving and the mech bay was about to be exposed to hard vacuum. The cockpit became a flurry of activity as the flight crew made preparations. Lieutenant Sharpova proceeded through her own pre-launch checklist and made a visual survey of her surroundings through the cockpit viewports and monitors when she noticed a large humanoid-shaped shadow moving in her underbelly camera. The angle was wrong and a blind spot prevented direct visual confirmation, but the shadow looked large enough to be Featherstone's Warhammer battle mech moving into position for pickup. Cadet Bjerke's desperate screaming voice broke out over Sharpova's headset. Sharpova! That mech isn't ours! It's the fucking Black Knight! Get us out of here! Move now, goddammit! Move now! But it was too late. Sharpova saw a flash of bright white energy streak past the camera, a PPC blast emanating out of the Black Knight's chest. The high energy particle slammed into the lightly armored leg of the assassin and ripped it clean off at the hip joint. Several green flashes of emerald tinged coherent light lanced out towards the crippled mech and burned through the opening in the torso, finding one of the assassin's two ammo bins. The laser energy overheated several short-ranged missiles and caused their propellant to explode. 
A rapid chain reaction of explosions ripped through the missiles in the tightly packed ammunition bin, and the mech disintegrated in a fiery death blossom inside the instigator's mech bay. A Leopard-class dropship mech bay is large, but it is cluttered with scaffolds and repair equipment, plus many tons of munitions opened and ready for reloading battle mechs. The exposed munitions detonated and ripped through the bay, killing the tech crew and blew the four main gullwing mech doors partially open. Ruptured fuel lines and power conduits added to the blaze, creating a hellscape conflagration that threatened the whole vessel. Lieutenant Sharpova felt the explosions rock the ship. Panic overcame her and she reflexively slammed her engine throttle forwards. The fuel metering valves deep in the drive section opened fully and dumped fuel into the main engine reactor. The ship lurched forward violently. Its nose smashed through several buildings, showering the streets with rubble and flaming debris from the blazing mech bay before tilting upwards into an aggressive 3G high-angle burn. Come on! Climb! Climb! Lieutenant Sharpova repeated the phrase like a mantra, barely hearing herself over the noise created by the thundering main drive engines. If she reached high enough altitude, the air would thin and starve the conflagration in the mech bay of oxygen and put out the fire. The immense dropship was gaining speed, but nowhere near as fast as she expected. And she was becoming concerned about the violent vibrations she felt through her command chair. The cacophony was unbearable and confusing. Alarm klaxons screamed from every panel around her. Shouts from her crew warned of systems failures, heat sink failures, and structural failures. But she had to press on and keep climbing. The main door lock warning light on the instigator mech bay control panel switched to red and started blinking. It was a seemingly innocuous warning amongst so many more pressing issues. Maybe if Lieutenant Sharpova was in less panicked state, she would have seen the danger and reduced her speed, but her piloting was driven by fear. Air resistance pulled at the already weakened doors and made them rattle. That rattle soon became a violent shake that bent the gullwing door's hinges farther. The misaligned doors caught even more air and increased the lateral load well beyond their structural design limits. When the latches succumbed to metal fatigue, all four massive doors flew open in quick succession, exposing them fully to the high-speed air passing over them. The immense force ripped the doors from the dorsal structure of the instigator, sending wide, ragged cracks through the ship's upper spine, effectively splitting the giant machine in half. The warship shuddered violently and rapidly disintegrated into two main pieces. The aft engineering section was still under main engine power and continued upwards, but the nose spun violently and hurtled towards the ground. Lieutenant Sharpova and the other crew members of the instigator were exposed to extreme G-forces that were far too much for any human to endure. They were dead in a matter of seconds, crushed to death by the weight of their own bodies. The pilot of the Black Knight watched the catastrophe from the ground and followed the nose portion of the burning wreckage as it traveled downwards into the open plain where the final fuel refinery sat. He could not see its final impact due to the tall buildings around him, but the explosion and mushroom-shaped cloud of billowing orange fire rising high into the atmosphere confirmed its landing zone. He had already seen two other mushroom clouds like this one. It was the unmistakable sign of a fuel refinery explosion glowing bright in the darkening night sky. Skull Squadron's mission was now complete. The pilot of the Black Knight considered the destruction they had just caused. The Phoenix Hawk pilot had been cooked by extreme heat. The cockpit of the Panther was in ruins, its pilot shredded by powerful high-velocity explosive rounds intended to destroy mechs and armored vehicles. The Assassin pilot was either vaporized by an internal ammunition explosion or was burned into carbon dust by the raging conflagration within the enemy dropship's mech bay. These types of violent ends are the fate of most mech warriors, and all battle mech pilots accept this potential doom. But it was not his fate that day, nor the fate of his lancemates. He didn't celebrate the demise of his enemies, but he did celebrate the survival of his friends, and himself. The Black Knight stomped off towards the Warhammer. There might be a survivor on board, and the pilot decided he would like to have a chat, if possible. The only way to do so was face to face. A dangerous risk, but one worth taking. The commander opened up a communication channel to his dropship located in high orbit. Charon, this is Skull 1. Any Ops 4 on your scope. Over. The pilot of the Charon replied, her Davian accent coming in crisply over the comms. Charon, no activity detected on our scopes. You are all clear for now. Over. 
The commander of Skull Squadron replied, Skull 1, acknowledged. Prepare for dropship evac, but take your time. I have something to do down here. Over. Charon, Wilco, we will land at the designated extraction point in 20 mics. Over. The pilot replied, but her voice gave away some of her feelings of concern. Normally the commander did not dilly-dally at a combat site once the battle was over, but this mission was special. The commander ended the call with a precise, Skull 1, acknowledged, out. The Black Knight pilot switched over to his Lance Communications channel and took on a more conversational tone. Short-range communications were less likely to be monitored, allowing a higher level of security. Skull Squadron, well done on our victory today. Once again, you have demonstrated your professionalism, skill, and teamwork in combat. I am proud to call myself your leader. Maybe Fahad will open up a case of Timbiki Dark when we get aboard the Charon, eh? I'm going to dismount and have a look at this Warhammer we took down. I think we might be able to salvage it. Rhino, you and Athena will provide site security. Long Branch will stay here and provide fire support with his archer if needed. Understood? The Skull Squadron mech warriors confirmed their orders and quickly moved into position. The Lance knew that their leader was going to be in a vulnerable position while outside of his battle mech. He was showing his full trust in their abilities, and they weren't going to let him down. The pilot of the archer stepped his 70-ton machine close to the Black Knight and expertly brought the open palm of its upturned battle fist level with his lance leader's cockpit. Long Branch always demonstrated precision and professionalism in whatever task he was given. His accurate gunnery skills and calm voice inspired confidence in the rest of the lance. The hatch located at the back of the Black Knight's head popped open and the pilot wriggled out to quickly climb into the archer's palm, squatting low and bracing himself with both hands. Long Branch turned his mech and brought the archer's hand down slowly to ground level, bending the mech's knees to bring the lance leader as low to the ground as possible. The dismounted mech warrior hopped lightly to the ground, then pulled out a small Geiger counter from a belt pouch before approaching the deactivated Warhammer. He seemed satisfied with the radiation levels and climbed up to the partially smashed cockpit screen, pulling reinforced glass out of the way to gaze upon its occupant. Featherstone was still conscious, but he could feel himself fading. Undoubtedly, he was bleeding out somewhere, but he was unable to feel the wound or move to staunch the bleeding. The sound of scraping metal and the crunch of smashed glass woke him from his stupor enough to focus his blurry sight onto the face of his vanquisher. The man before him was in his forties. His skin was pale from far too little exposure to natural starlight, a trait common among people who live mostly aboard dropships. Much of his sweat-matted hair was going gray, especially at his temples. He was a compact man, maybe five foot six inches tall, with an athletic build and intense green eyes that cut through Featherstone like lasers. He was dressed in an olive drab fire-resistant cooling vest and suit that was covered in sweat stains. It was very similar to the one that Featherstone wore. The name tag on the vest clearly read Mason, but the Merck Company patch on his shoulder wasn't the white and blue skull logo of Skull Squadron. It was the blue and orange horse head and sword logo of a Merck Company familiar to Featherstone. The crippled Breaker Lance commander understood at that moment that this was no ordinary Merc company out for sea bills. No, these Mercs were out for something else entirely. They were here for revenge. Featherstone struggled to speak. Nick's Cavaliers, you must be the son, but you're, you're dead. Featherstone coughed weakly and scarlet blood flecks stained his lips and chin. He angrily spat out in disbelief. Your mech was destroyed! Destroyed on DeBerry! Jake Mason's face momentarily contorted with white-hot anger, but he quickly brought himself under control. He understood now that this man in front of him was part of the Black Inferno forces that set a trap and murdered his father and the rest of his lancemates in cold blood. Nick's cavaliers were lured to the backwater planet of DeBerry through a counterfeit mercenary review board contract. They were ambushed by superior forces and eradicated mercilessly. Only Jake survived the trap due solely to the sacrifice made by his father and his fellow lancemates. He limped his heavily damaged 50-ton centurion back to the Charon in time for the dropship to escape in the chaos of the battle, avoiding detection through the skill and guts of its pilot, Rihanna Campbell. I'm afraid you were misinformed. Mason said coolly. Your confusion is understandable. 
Only a few members of the heavy Lancer company sent after my father survived the battle. They were too concerned with saving their own worthless hides to notice my escape, but I'm sure they took the bounty for my kill anyways. Mason paused for a moment and continued. Look, you're going to die here trapped inside this warhammer. There's no stopping it now. However, you have this one last chance to partially redeem yourself and reclaim some honor. You can tell me why Black Inferno murdered my father. What reason did your commanders give you? Featherstone stared at Mason's face in disbelief. This punk Mason talked of honor as if such a thing really existed. How ridiculous and naive. The truth was that the commanders of Black Inferno didn't share why they did what they did. They only offered money and glory. The why never mattered to Featherstone. He was paid to kill, so he killed. But he wasn't going to tell Mason that. Featherstone's face twisted into a wicked grin. We killed your father because he was the inbred son of a stinking whore. He then tried to spit at Mason, but all his weak lungs could manage was to send a bloody gob of spittle rolling down his own chin. Mason looked disappointed. That's a shame, he said calmly. Featherstone's insult appeared to have no effect whatsoever. Mason looked around the cockpit of the Warhammer and evaluated its condition. I think we're going to salvage this Warhammer. It's a bit beat up, but our tech can do wonders, and it will make a wonderful weapon to use against your employers. He then reached down and pulled a vibroblade knife out from a sheath built into his boot. The vibroblade snapped to life and emitted a low hum from its power unit. The blade edge blurred slightly as it oscillated back and forth at over a thousand times per second. Featherstone growled at the sight of the blade. You can't kill me like that! What about the precious honor you talked about? I'm a mech warrior, and I deserve a mech warrior's death. Mason hesitated for a second, then drew nearer to Featherstone to look into his eyes. No, you're not a mech warrior. You're a message. He then swiftly slashed Featherstone's neck, slicing easily through arteries and his windpipe. Blood spilled out through the gaping wound, and Featherstone gurgled for a moment before he shuddered one last time and died. Mason unbuckled Featherstone from his command chair and neuro helmet, then dragged him out of the cockpit and unceremoniously dumped his body overboard. His lifeless remains tumbled down the Warhammer's chest and landed with a thud on the hard-packed ground. As he stood on the top of the clobbered Warhammer, looking at Featherstone's remains, he dusted off his hands and joked harshly, Kill the meat, save the metal. He then made his way down the Warhammer and hopped to the ground next to the crumpled body of the enemy commander. Mason grabbed the corpse by the vest and dragged it over to a nearby slab of concrete and quickly scrawled the words, You're next, into the scorched and broken artificial stone. Leaving Featherstone like this would send a clear message to the commanders of Black Inferno. Something terrible was coming for them. It was a bit gruesome, but Mason wanted his enemy to be paranoid and anxious. It would cause them to make mistakes that he could take advantage of. He and Skull Squadron would tear Black Inferno apart piece by piece until all of their resources were wasted and all of their hiding spots were exposed. He would then face the people responsible and hold them to account. He was the pilot of a battle mech, the most potent war machine humankind had ever invented, and nothing would stand in his way.